Okay, my name is Michael Carter, and I'm the, the director of the History Club. Uh, welcome to my wife, Paulette. Uh, my brother, Steve, would usually be here, but he's got a bad cold. I've got some cousins over there that are, that are always here, and it's, it's good to have them here. Uh, we've been at, that so, at this a long time now, and things just keep getting better. Many thanks to the American Legion, which has been our home base for over 10 years now. Uh, many thanks to the wait staff. They work hard, so uh, please be generous with them. Thanks so much to Catch TV. Uh, Dave and his helper over there are, are uh, the guys that record these events. Uh, when the uh, Catch TV came on board in 2015, uh, things seemed to really take off for us. Uh, so many people can see it. What a professional bunch they are. Uh, they put all our programs on their channel. And in addition, I'm able to put every program they film on YouTube for everybody to see. We're up around 90 programs now, which is kind of cool, going way back. Uh, you know, many people can't attend because they have real jobs. Some of us are, you know, retired, a few of us. <laughs> and they can't attend, and uh, some of them live far away. And I hear from people uh, all over the country that uh, listen to these on, and watch them on YouTube. And they're really grateful for that. Uh, we're we are preserving local history here, and I hope people are able to watch these programs far into the future. Uh, so, if you want to watch any of these past programs that you had not seen, all you got to do is get on YouTube and type in uh, Monroe County History Club in the search engine, and they all come right up. I, I monitor these, so I've noticed we've had a big uptick in people watching all those old programs going back several years. So that's kind of rewarding. Uh, we work closely also with other local history-minded organizations. Uh, they are the Monroe County History Center, which I've been on the board for a couple of years, Monroe County Public Library, IU Photo Archives, Cats TV, of course, and others. We've done presentations on so many different subjects. Uh, the good part is we have many more to do yet. I've got a big want list, and uh, uh, there'll be more good programs. By the way, uh, do we have any first-time attendees here today? Uh, some people like to leave their email addresses for direct mail-in because they don't—they're not on Facebook, things like that. So, anybody wants to leave me their their uh, email address, I can give it to my buddy George Carpenter, and he can send out the the mail list. Uh, today we have Daniel Slagle here too. He's going to be selling books for the History Center. He'd like to say a few words. He's the director of the History Center. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I just had three items really quick. One is this coming Friday and Saturday, we have our big November garage sale extravaganza. So if you work at Cook or you're a museum member, you get in Friday, and then it's open to the public on Saturday. So it's a really big deal for us. It's a big support uh, fundraiser to support us. So if you're able to come out and you're looking for some deals or some early Christmas shopping, that's definitely the place to be. And then we also have our newspaper exhibit, Breaking the News, will be up through December 30th of this year. So if you've not been out to see it, you definitely need to come out. We've had a lot of people that said they didn't realize how much time it took them to go through that. So they've come back two and three times to see the entire exhibit. It is quite large and it was, it's an excellent exhibit. So I strongly suggest you come out. And then the last thing I was just talking with Michael is we received the HT photograph collection and we're busy trying to identify as much information and in all of those photos as we can. So we're actually gonna partner with the History Club and bring some of those photos early in these upcoming months. So anyone that would like to come in a little early, we'll work with Michael to make sure we get those announcements out. But you can come in and look through some of the old photographs that we have that we're trying to identify information from because we figured this crowd might know a thing or two about history, so we're hoping you'll help us capture all of that. So thank you, everyone. We have some books and some neat stuff down here. I have more garage sale handouts if you need to take one with you, like me, so you don't forget. And hopefully we'll see you on Friday or Saturday. All right. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, we're scheduled pretty far ahead, so here's a little uh, list of uh, coming attractions. Uh, the next one, November 28th, Duncan Campbell, who's given several programs here before, will give a program on the Indiana Barn and Transition. 
And I haven't looked into that yet and seen what that's about, but anything Duncan does is first rate. I'll find out more about that later. Uh, on January 2nd, 2024, Rosie Gerstman will give a program on the history of Smithville. It's called Smithville in Smithville, Indians, Pioneers, Ski Bows, and Lake Monroe. This presentation will introduce you to family names of, of individuals that help the area of Monroe County flourish and to introduce to education and sports. January 30th of that uh, 2024, Dr. John Butler will give a program called Depots, Platforms, and Flagstops, a history of the railroad places in Monroe County. Uh, let's see, February 27th, which will mark our 11th anniversary program, uh, Jill Vance will give a program on, called To Build a Reservoir, The Origin of Monroe Lake. Next program, March 26th, 2024, Nan Brewer would be the history of the IU School of Fine Arts, Museums, Collections. Nan's been with the Eskenazi Museum for many years. April 30th, 2024, Christine Friesel, who's here with the Monroe County uh, Public Library, give a program called Who's Your Character? A Digital Map of the 19th Century. Then May 28, 2024, Roger Robinson, who's given a couple of programs, will give a program called State Championship Teams for Monroe County High Schools from the dates 1904 to 2014. June 25th, Kurt Sylvester, who's the state president of the Indiana Genealogical Society, uh, will give a program on the early settler families of Monroe County, who they were and uh, what they brought to this county. July 30th, a look at the history of Cats TV. One of those guys is going to give a program on their own outfit, which turns 50 years old in 2024. August 27th, John Summerlot will take a look at uh, racially restrictive property covenants in Monroe County's past. September 24th, and this is one I just scheduled just the other day, uh, we talked about having one on university school. Well, we're going to have one. Uh, Dina Kellams of the IU Photo Archives will give a history of University High School, which was here from 1939 to 1972. And then just yesterday, I got this one on October 29th, a whole year ahead of today. It'd be a history of Bloomington, Monroe County by Glenda Murray. And she's the official historian of Monroe County. Brings us to today. Uh, Bloomington's Feltus family, and I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people don't know much about the Feltus family, but they will after this, I'm sure. Uh, it's called Soldiers, Printers, Politicians, and Circus Folk. It will focus on H.J. Feltus and his wife Ella, their children and grandchildren. It will explore the family, dynamics, and involvement of its members in popular entertainment and their relationship with other Bloomington families of the Gilded Age. So, Rod, here we go. Thank you. Uh, I'm not used to speaking in a room this large, so uh, if you can't hear me, please um, raise your hand and I'll try to do better. Um, happy Halloween to everyone. I am not in costume. I always look like this. <laughs> you know, I was having lunch recently at the Crazy Horse, and a woman came up that I'd ne never met before. She clapped me on the shoulder and said, you're the spitting image of Andy Reid, the Kansas City football coach. <laughs> and I pretended I didn't know who Andy Reid was because I'm not sure that was a compliment. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm still not. Uh, but thanks to you anyway for being here. Uh, we are going to talk about the Feltus family. And, and up front, I just want to acknowledge uh, a number of folks that had helped me out. Uh, Jennifer and uh, James Spore, uh, who were descendants of the Feltus family, the Monroe County History Center, where I volunteer, uh, the Monroe County Public Library, where I do all my microfilm research, and uh, Trinity Episcopal Church for letting me poke through some of their files. Now, um, I got my hands full of too many things here. Uh, these are the principal people we're going to talk about. Now, I'm not fr originally from Monroe County. I spent most of my life in uh, Vandenberg, Warwick, Pike Counties down in the southwest. 
So when I moved here in 2003 to start work at Herald Times, I had to acquaint myself with a whole new set of uh, names that had been around for generations. Uh, so I got pretty familiar with Wampler and Deckard and Ferris and those kinds of folks, but I'd never heard of a Feltus. And then uh, Jim Spohr is a friend of mine, and he mentioned uh, that he was descended from a family that ran newspapers here for 90 years. And uh, that, I was kind of stumped by that. But after I started uh, volunteering at the History Center, I kept tripping across the names in the files and records and various things I was looking at. And uh, I finally came to the conclusion, why don't we know about these people? You have, uh, see how this works, yeah. H.J. there, he was a Civil War cavalry officer. He was a newspaper founder. He was a city councilman. He was a postmaster here. He uh, ran a vaudeville theater for a few years. And yet, oh, and he was also an exalted ruler of uh, Elks Lodge number 446 in Bloomington. But, but I had never heard of him, and I, and I assume a lot of you folks haven't either. Um, and uh, it's really not hard uh, to figure out why, so I'm going to start with this slide, because it may be one of the few questions I can answer, and that is, here is H.J. and Ella Feltis there, um, the kind of the at the top of the family pyramid here in Bloomington. And here are their uh, children. You got four guys and one uh, daughter. So that's a pretty good start because, you know, in our society, family names are passed on through the male side in most cases. So let's go to the next generation and let's see what we got here. We got a Pearl, we got a Dorothy, we got a Virginia, we got a Catherine, we got a Jeanette, a Paula, and a Martha, and those are their married names that they took. Uh, so, and Harry never had any kids, so uh, probably in two generations, a lot of the name uh, got wiped out because, uh, well, it's just the nature of our society. And here is another kind of putting both those slides together. And uh, I've also in added to this, uh, and this is the, the handout I have. I have uh, a couple Lefflers there and Bob Harris because they were intricately connected to the Feltus family through Olive's marriage to Roy. Uh, and we'll see more of that in a little bit. Here is a Feltus household in 1900, and they're living in the 300 block of East 3rd Street. Uh, it would be about just past where the uh, police station is now. And here is, here is who was living there. You got Henry and Ella, and her, her name really is Catherine Ella, but everybody called her Ella. And uh, Gertrude, uh, and that's pronounced Romiser. Uh, she was their eldest daughter, eldest child, and she had already been married, divorced, and had two kids, Pearl and Dorothy. And they all lived uh, in the Feltus house. And then you had the boys, Harry, Roy, John, and Paul. Uh, so that was kind of that was quite a crew. And what did they do? Well, Harry and Paul were identified as uh, editor of the Star newspaper and the pr a printer for the Star Printing Company, respectively. Harry, John, and Roy were listed as showmen. John and Roy worked for circuses as pub uh, publicists and advance men. Harry, at the time, uh, in 1909, he was touring with Robert, one of Robert Harris's uh, theater companies. Harris, uh, as you may know, he was the guy that built the Harris Grand and Princess Theaters. And then he had uh, traveling shows that would go out in the summer in the days before air conditioning. And they'd travel around the Midwest and 
maybe get as far as the East Coast with a, a variety of productions. And Harry was uh, touring with them in 1909. And then uh, shortly after that, he came back and joined the family printing concern. 1910, actually it was about uh, mid-1900, 1905, 1906, uh, this property was purchased on East 2nd Street. And uh, this is where it is today. It's directly across from what used to be the Elm Heights uh, Blooming Foods location. And this property is dead across the street. And it took me a while to figure out that this was the same house. Uh, it's, if you get over here on the side, it's easier to tell. But the trees there kind of make it hard to take a photo. But uh, they put this ugly porch across the front and subdivided it. Um, but it, it is the same pr uh, footprint. It, it was a huge house. It was like 2,500 square feet six or seven bedrooms, and they needed it for all that crew. And uh, our Gabby, who's assistant curator of the History Center, tells me that she lived here when she was in college. So if, there, if you have any questions about ghosts of the Feltuses in this house, you need, just need to talk to Gabby later. Uh, let's see, where are Okay, I want to get, so I make sure I got all these people. Um, you see the front porch of the original house here, and that became, that was the go-to spot when you wanted to take a family picture. And these people were together all the time. And in this one, uh, this was, I date this to uh, 1923 because that's the year this little, person here was born, and uh, I think what we have here, we have H.J., we have his daughter Gertrude, her daughter Pearl, and her do daughter Dorothy, and uh, these are Pearl's kids. This is Pearl's husband, Bill Wallace. He, they live in Terre Haute, and this is Lucille, and she, uh, Lucille Feltis, and she is married uh, to Paul Feltus, H.J.'s uh, uh, youngest child. Here's another from the front porch, uh, and this is uh, Gertrude and, and uh, Dorothy with uh, Virginia and Catherine. They are Lefflers, and they live in a house just a block away. Here's another one from... Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, Dot here, uh, as she was called. Her name was also Dorothy Catherine. They called her Dot, and she was about two years old here. Uh, the picture is labeled Dot's two-year-old uh, two birthday party. And here is uh, the lineup of cousins. And uh, let's see, we... Got them listed here. Oh, yeah, they're at the side there. Uh, you see who they are. There's uh, left to right, Dot, Sam Hutton, I don't know who he is, uh, the, the Wallace kid, uh, Jack Leffler, uh, Bob Wallace, Catherine Feltis, and Bob Leffler. Some of you may remember Bob Leffler. He was a, a professionally trained singer and choral conductor, and then when he retired and came back to town, he did a lot of... Uh, research on the original plats of Bloomington. Uh, and they lived, uh, their dad was James P. Leffler, and he built a house next to the Feltus family uh, sometime between 1910 and 1920. So, uh, and then, as I said, Catherine lived in the next block. So it's a pretty good place to be a kid when you got all these cousins and aunts and uncles all within a block or two. Uh, it would be, be uh, not a bad place to be. 1920s were a time of transition for the family. 
Ela, uou, go back. Wow, I got really out of sorts there. Um, Ella dies in 1922. H.J. follows in 1926. And that's kind of, you know, that was the center of this family's universe for, the, for those two. And, um, and that's not there anymore. So uh, some of the, the boys, uh, Mary, uh, John, and, and Paul, and Roy married in 1909. Uh, and then Harry builds a new house for himself, Gertie, Dorothy, and Dorothy's uh, daughter, Dot, in Elm Heights. This, this is at First and uh, Hawthorne. And the house still looks just like that. You can drive down the street and find it. It's right there at the corner. Now, this is the first Henry James Feltus. And you'll have to bear in mind that every generation of this family had at least one Henry James and often multiple Henry James. Uh, just like on the, on the mother's side, there was, there was a whole bunch of Catherines. So that's why, you know, they picked these names like uh, nicknames to differentiate themselves from someone else in the same family. Uh, Reverend Henry James, he's a Methodist Episcopalian immigrates to the U.S. in 1795 from Ireland. Uh, he and his wife Mary arrive in New York on the 4th of July. They have 15 kids, and number 12 is named Lambert, and he is the father of Bloomington's Harry, Henry Feltus. Hen, uh, Henry's, uh, H, I'm going to call him H.J., because I'm going to do the same thing. Our, our uh, Bloomington Feltus, is, his name is H.J. now. And um, his father moves to Cincinnati to take a job in a bank. And uh, Henry and his older brother, Charles, uh, go with him, join him there. Uh, their mother has died by this time. And uh, the father eventually remarries. But here they are. This is Cincinnati. I was there this summer. So this is from, ooh, I keep hitting the wrong button. This is from one of the highest points in. Uh, this is from one of the highest points in Cincinnati, Mount Washington. If anybody are familiar with Cincinnati, and this spot, this bend in the river, purportedly is a halfway point between Pittsburgh and Cairo, Illinois. So, and that has nothing to do with the Feltus family. I just find that interesting. Uh, so they're living in Cincinnati when the Civil War breaks out. H.J.'s father and his older brother Charles uh, enlist in immediately. And Charles uh, is stationed on a gunboat in the Mississippi River. And he serves a two-year enlistment um, and then settles in Madison, Indiana. Now, now put a pin in that because it will be relevant in just a couple more slides. Uh, Henry, I mean H.J., is also in Madison, because that's where he enlists in 1864, in January. Um, there's probably some of the Civil War folks here, and you all know that you had to be 18 to enlist uh, without a parent's permission. And AJ, I mean, H.J. was just a little shy of his 18th birthday when he enlisted. But the state record of his enlistment shows that he was 21. Now, I don't know what happened there, but uh, anyway, he got in. He served uh, the rest of the war. It was about from January 1864 to November 1865. He was in campaigns in Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, got wounded by a sniper outside of Nashville, or at least that's his story. And then uh, after he gets out, uh, he goes to Madison because that's where his brother is. And there's something else in Madison that draws his attention, and that's a girl. This is Ella, Catherine Ella Baird was her maiden name. And um, they were smitten you know, from the first. Smitten is a wonderful uh, 19th uh, century word 
you read newspapers from that period, and you see it all the time. Uh, there was like an epidemic of smitting going on. Uh, and Ella tell, told her grandkids do, uh, stories about that time. Uh, she talked about seeing Morgan's Raiders dry, uh, ride by her house in the middle of the night. And she told a story about her younger daughter, Mary, or her younger sister, I'm sorry, her younger sister, Mary, who one day ran off, said she was going to go to Cairo to marry a soldier who was serving on a gunboat. Now, if you remember, guess who that was? Uh, and uh, and uh, Ella told, uh, at the way she told the story, it said, her sister wrote this on a barn door. It may be years and it may be forever. Well, it turned out to be forever for both the sisters because her sister married Charles in 1862, or, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right, 1862. There's too many dates in this, doing history. And then Ella married H.J. Uh, in uh, 18, I've got it on the cheat sheet, 1875 in um, Terre Haute. So they get, they get married uh, in Terre Haute. I'm sorry, it was 1872. So they get married in 1872, and H.J. Uh, and his brother are running a, a drugstore, but H.J. wants to be a newspaper man. Now, he'd been a, a correspondent for the Cincinnati Enquirer, uh, and that entailed just anything of interest that happened. You would send it to the Cincinnati and... Maybe he'd get paid for it, but he liked that idea. So he gets an opportunity to go to uh, Greencastle, and, he, and that's where he starts the first newspaper, the Greencastle Star, in 1872. Now, that lasted three years, and then it burned down. Newspapers famously burned down all the time in this period. Um, and so... After it burned down, a delegation of, of Democrats from Monroe County approached him and said, hey, why don't you come to Bloomington and, and uh, start your paper up? Because we need a paper to publicize the Democrat Party. Uh, at that time, Democrats hadn't won any offices here since the Civil War, um, and they thought having a paper would help them. So H.J. comes to, to Bloomington, starts in 1875, and his first paper, The Courier, uh, lasts that long, and then uh, he and his son, Harry, start The Weekly Star, and then by the Star Courier comes along, well, H.J. Uh, is gone, and his sons, Harry and Paul, and his daughter, Gertrude, uh, and, and also his granddaughter, Dorothy, uh, have taken that over and uh, carried on that tradition. I put this, uh, this slide is from 1881, and I put it up there because this is one of the earliest, you see there, there's H.J. Feltus, Ella Feltus, and they get, you know, H.J. gets top billing, but they get co-credit as editors. And this is, uh, and uh, he started doing this as, as far back as, as 1876. So that's one of the earliest uh, references I've seen of a, a woman being credited uh, with working on a newspaper in Bloomington. And it was a struggle for the first uh, four or five years. H.J. Uh, wrote uh, extensively about it later. He said he couldn't get anybody by description in advance because they were sure he was going to fail. He could get people to advertise, but he couldn't get anybody to pay for their advertisements. And it, and he kept, you know, he kept. He was told frequently, "So just give it up. It's no good. It'll never work." And this was, I like this quote. Uh, quote: Many Democrats came to town every Saturday to buy a piece of bacon and a quart of whiskey, and that event seemed to satisfy them with life. I was informed. 
And he and that was written on his uh, the year he'd been a uh, newspaper editor in Bloomington for 50 years at that point. Uh, but he almost didn't make it after the first five, and there was you know any besides the problem I'd mentioned, he was also being dogged by uh, his creditors because there wasn't a lot of money coming in, certainly not enough, uh, barely enough to. Uh, survive as a business and certainly not to provide for a growing, a very large and growing family. Uh, they had two kids when they moved to uh, Bloomington and uh, they shortly had three more. 1880s were better. Uh, he got on the city council for a year. He was appointed postmaster for uh, one to Grover Cleveland's last term. And in 1887, he was co-manager of the Bloomington Opera House. And he was co-manager with his, uh, he ran a Democratic newspaper. The Republican newspaper was run by Walter Bradfoot. And uh, uh, by all accounts, they were, they were fast friends, so they decided to co-manage the Bloomington Opera House. Both of them enjoyed what was termed at the time as the popular entertainment. It's theater, musical reviews, vaudeville. Uh, they loved it, and their uh, and H.J.'s kids did too. And um, oh, I have a. I just got. This is a, a topical presentation, but I just got some information today from the city council. Uh, all of his uh, biographical data, and including his obit, said he was on the city council in 1880. The city council sent me some pages from uh, the minute books that showed, no, it, he was on the city council from 17, let me see if I get this right, 1787 to 1788. So, I, again, uh, I think H.J. must have had a problem with numbers because he couldn't get his age right on his enlistment papers and it, and he got this wrong too um, but they sent me his signature on the on the minute book so I tend to believe that um, it said that Henry Henry uh, passed his love of theater on to his children uh, they couldn't and eventually uh, some of them actually got in um, show business, and all of them liked the stage. Um, from reading what they what they left in their writings, Henry apparently, uh, they got a lot of passes to shows. Uh, Henry probably traded it out for advertising. That wasn't unusual in those times. And Henry liked to go himself, so. And uh, while they, while, uh, while H.J. And, and Bradfoot were managing uh, the Opera House, there was an act debuted in 1877, Henry Gentry's and his trained dogs. And that lit a fire under, under particularly Roy and John. They really liked the idea of, you know, the circus life appealed to them. And it wasn't long, Roy started hanging out at the Gentry Brothers Farm on South Rogers, trying to learn what he could. And it wasn't but a few years that he actually went out on shows with them. And uh, John, who was younger, also did this. Uh, he, um, he got on with others. He eventually got on with the Ringling Brothers, and he did a lot of advertising and promotion work for him. And that's a lot of what Roy did, too, initially. Gertrude, she liked uh, the musicians and the actors. Uh, this quote, that's in our, uh, hey, have all of you seen the newspaper exhibit at the History Center? I'm sure you have. Well, this quote's in it. And if you haven't seen it, a good time to go would be the day after Thanksgiving. We have an annual open house before the canopy of lights, and it's a lot of fun, and there's no grumpy people there on the day after Thanksgiving. Everybody's happy. Um, and not that there are grumpy people there all the time, but you certainly won't find any there. Um, 
But Rachel Peden, it was a Hoosier farm wife, and she was writing about Gertrude um, in 1948 and said one of her secrets to long life is she does as she pleases, and that certainly is true, uh, particularly in she when she pleased to be married. Uh, this is uh, Gertrude and her first husband, Frank Romeiser. They married in 1891. They divorced in 1898. They have two children, Paula and Dorothy. Now, Dorothy's name, it's kind of interesting. In her early records, it's Dorothy Catherine with a C. And then when she became a newspaper person, it became Dorothy K with a hard K. <laughs> And um, and um, I believe Paul came up with that, uh, to call her Dorothy Kay. And, you know, in the newspaper world, you know, if you want your byline, you want it short, you want it snappy, you want a hard consonant in there somewhere um, because that's something you remember. Well, um, after the divorce... Dorothy and the kids come home, live with, oh, Frank was a tailor in town, uh, but he was also a musician, uh, well known as a musician. And I, and I want you to, I want to read for you how their wedding announcement ran in the papers, because I, I think it'll tell you a little something. The first one I'm going to read was in the Winchester Herald on uh, November the 11th, 1891. And it reads, Frank Romeiser, who's been tailoring in Bloomington for a year, arrived home last Thursday. Accompanying him was Miss Gertrude Feltus, daughter of the editor of the Democrat at that place. During Frankie's stay there, the two met and were smitten. See, I didn't make that up. Right there. The parents objected and as forbidden fruits are sweetest, it grew deeper and resulted in their coming here to get married. Frank is 17, and his wife is 18. Frank, although young, is a good tailor and a good boy, and no doubt he can make his way. His wife is pretty and petite, and he is not to be blamed. <laughs> now, 10 days later, on November 21st, here is how her father's newspaper handled this announcement. Married on Tuesday, November 8th, Mr. Frank Romeiser of Winchester, Indiana, to Miss Gertrude B. Feltus, daughter of the editor of the Courier of this city. The young couple will reside in Winchester for the present. So there was something telling me that there was not quite the same, you know, reception in the two places. And then uh, in 1909, Gertrude marries an actor with the, with the Harris Production Company. His name is James Vincent Chest. They marry in 19, uh, 1909, divorce in 1912, but they didn't live together that long. It was not a good match. But here is how, uh, let's see here. I have an announcement that was in the, oh, this was in the telephone, the Walter Bradford's paper. It was on July 27th, 1909. Quite a surprise is the marriage of Mrs. Gertrude Romeiser of this city to J. Vincent Chess of the Harris Parkinson Company, which occurred at Lawrenceville, Illinois, Monday the 19th. Mrs. Romeiser was a guest of the Harris Company for a week and returned home a few days ago, but not even her close friends knew of the wedding until she let out the secret. Um, so, um, oh, there it is. I have too many, no, I don't have enough hands. Okay, um, as, as we've said here that uh, Paula and Dorothy, and they were quite young, you know, uh, uh, you know, younger than ten when, when they came to live within the Feltus household. But we've 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 already showed you all those, um, you know, cousins and aunts and and everybody that they had to 
to look after them than the grandparents, um, and so and great grandparents actually. So um, it wasn't a bad place to be a kid. In 1941, the children of H. J. and Ella commissioned a stained glass window in their honor, which still is, uh, adorns the sanctuary of Trinity Episcopal Church in Bloomington. That's where H. J. S. family generally were all members. And among those paying tributes to the couple was granddaughter Pearl Romizer Wallace, who described what it was like growing up in the Feltus household. And if you don't mind, I'll read a little bit of that. These windows, um, the, the, the name of uh, Ella and H.J. are down there at the bottom. And there are some symbols that the children picked out uh, to be put on each side of their name. H.J.'s are cross swords and crossed quill pens to commemorate his cavalry service and also his uh, newspaper life. Uh, for Ella, uh, they selected a book and a rose because she was a, a big gardener. Okay. Um, so Pearl's talking about her grandfather first. And she says, as a child, I remember the little things about him. Peppermint and licorice drops he carried in his pockets. Solitaire games he taught us. Old congressional record books. He gave us to paste my treasured clippings in for scrapbooks. And sometimes a tube robe, a tube rose in his coat lapel. He had time to play games with us. We'd hang a sheet for a curtain, and he'd amuse us by making silhouettes of rabbits and elephants with his hands. He would do mind reading tricks for us. I'd concentrate on an object in the room, and blindfolded, he would put my hand to his forehead and lead me to it. I'd like to go to his office after school. He let me do errands, fold newspapers, and sometimes help to print them on the press. I'd like to ride with my foot. I sorted type and put it back into alphabetically arranged trays sitting on a high stool. Many times I'd wait to walk home with him. I was proud of him, the way he walked, so dignified and so kind to all within his household. In memory of my grandmother, there is a book and a flower in the church window. She loved them, books like In Tune with the Infinite, Longfellow's Poems, Jane Eyre, Jane Eyre, I Eyre, whatever, and her Bible. She made many scrapbooks of poetry, household hints, pictures of animals, flowers, and children. She contributed articles to the newspaper then. She cherished her flowers and could grow a rose from a slip under a glass jar. She watched for her first rosebud and brought it in for us to see its beauty. Okay. She liked to read by lamplight to my sister and me. Sometimes when I couldn't go to sleep, she'd read Little Tin Soldier and wink and blink and nod and Helen's Babies. And... Uh, and that goes and that goes on, but that as I think we painted a pretty good picture there that that the it wasn't about a household to grow up in if you're a kid. And this is um, Gertrude's daughter Dorothy, who uh, Romizer, who came uh, to live with them after. Um, well, after her mother divorced uh, uh, Mr. Romizer. And she married, she kind of followed in her mother's footsteps. She married a musician, Virgil Moore, who she met at a dance in Martinsville. Now, they weren't together a long time, but long enough to, to have a daughter of their own. And she was named, also named Dorothy Catherine, uh, which is why uh, that got shortened to Dot. This is uh, Dorothy Moore now and Dot, and this is Dorothy. This is Dorothy here. This is Gertie, and you can barely see it, but there's a little baby right here, and that's 
and that's dot. Uh, at least that's what it said on the back of the print. And here is, um, this is her 1912 Detroit Electric. She got this in 1924 from the uh, pastor at uh, the Episco Episcopalian Church in Indianapolis, the one that's right on Monument Circle. She went there for a christening, and it was raining, so the minister gave her a ride in this automobile. And uh, he mentioned he'd really like to find somebody to buy it because he's getting ready to retire. And she liked, uh, she liked the way that it made no noise as it went down the street. So she bought it from him, brought it to Bloomington. And um, her, uh, uh, Dorothy and the other grandchildren of, uh, and Dot, they say that she used to work on it herself in uh, the old garage or carriage house where they kept it. And she bought a converter so that they could charge the batteries from uh, the service that they had. And every afternoon, you could see Gertie. Uh, she would drive H.J. from his office at the, the paper down to the Elks Club, where it was said that he would relieve the young sports of his daily cigar money. And uh, this is a four-generation picture. One, two, three. Yep, I got it right. Four generations of uh, in the um, in his household. We have Gertrude. We have Dorothy here. There's H.J. and here's Dot. And again, I think this is about 1923 since uh, she's so little. And and then H.J. is gone in, in 1926. Here's Dorothy K. later in life. This is at uh, Monroe County Fair. It was held in the, when they held it a few years in the IU Fieldhouse. And she was working for, um, she was a newspaper columnist, but she also worked for the Chamber of Commerce. During World War II, she was secretary of the uh, Monroe County Rationing Board. And she was also, by this time, she'd been made a, a board member and secretary treasurer of the Feltus Printing Corporation. Now, this is a Dot with her best friend, Mary Lou Beard. I don't know. Maybe some of you are familiar with, with that. Um, but, huh? Oh. But they were best friends, and this is uh, probably near um, Dorothy's, I mean, Dot's uh, house in, and I have... Yeah. Uh, Dorothy left some notes, too, about, about living with uh, Gertrude and Dorothy. And this is about, what I'm going to read you now is mostly about um, uh, Dorothy. My mother, Dorothy K. Romiser Moore, was not only wise, she was witty and pretty. Mother had lots of friends. They all walked to school together, clear over to McCalla Elementary. Her diaries show going to lots of dances, ball games, and each other houses to make fudge and sing around the piano. We lived with Harry and my grandma. Grandma was with me a lot while mother worked. Mother and I used to walk on the red brick sidewalk to town to the post office or the dime store. Mother had many chances to go out to dinner or a movie, but she usually was with me evenings. We had lots of friends, and her friends' kids were my friends. Mother and I shared a bedroom, and we used to go out on the upstairs porch and sleep on it when it was hot. And if you remember that photo, that house has an upstairs porch. And then um, lastly here, Mother and Mary Lou Beard's mother took us to games, tournaments, corn throwing on Halloween. Now, that's something I never did. And to Indianapolis to big band shows. Mother used to give away her ration stamps to people who needed them. Again, uh, you know, 
this is not a bad, uh, and this is Uncle Harry, who they lived with, never married, no kids. Born in 1874. In 1875, he established the Weekly Star and Feltus Printing Company. This was his uh, father had sold the courier to the Craven Brothers, which was kind of like the Gannett Corporation of their day. They were just going around buying up everybody. Um, and uh, this uh, started as basically a commercial printing firm. And if you look at uh, a lot of the yearbooks we have at the History Center, if you go back to the first part of the 20th century, many of those were printed uh, by the Feltus Printing Company, um, particularly like University Heights and, and I know Unionville, uh, and a lot of those were done by them. In eight, um, you know, he was also a military guy, like his, like his father. I mean, three of the four brothers served in the Indiana militia, later the Indiana National Guard. And uh, Harry was in the Guard when it got called up to serve in the Spanish-American War. Let me jump forward a minute. There's a group picture of Company H, Indiana National Guard, and Harry's in there somewhere. And you say, this was uh, printed by the Craven Brothers. And I found a clip from uh, a newspaper um, from the Craven's papers at that time. They had a picture of Harry, and they described him as um, their Spanish-American war correspondent. Uh, I don't know what their father thought of that. But anyway, um, he, as, as, as you may know, these, uh, these guys weren't actually deployed overseas. Um, the war was over before they finished their training. Uh, and uh, let's see, what's, what's that? Oh, yeah. Um, and then uh, he took a little time off, we'll get to in a minute, uh, from the printing corporation, but he came back in 1920. Well, in 1920, they, he was named uh, secretary, treasurer, and mechanical superintendent, kind of like, you know, he was a press foreman uh, of a reorganized company. Here's what he did after he got out of the uh, uh, active service. Uh, he took a little, uh, in Australia, they called it a walkabout. You know, he, he worked as a printer in Kokomo, Indianapolis, and at Indiana University. And then around 1909, he went on on tour with Robert Harris's production of Daniel Boone on the Trail. And this is one of Harris's stock uh, pieces that he would play in wherever they, they went. And I can't say for sure, but the guy on this horse kind of looks like I would think Harry would look. He was, uh, he was like his father. He wasn't a big guy, which made him good for a horse. Um, but I can't say that for sure, but this was uh, from uh, the Feltus family uh, collection, so I'm not sure why they would have it if, you know, uh, he wasn't in there somewhere. Uh, this is Roy Feltus. He was born in 1875. In 1909, he married uh, Olive Leffler, who lived down the block. They had two children. Uh, born in 1912, and Catherine born in 1915. And there's a story about that, too. Roy was a circus guy. He got his start with the Gentry Brothers, and then he did all these other shows, even spent a season with Buffalo Bill uh, before getting on with the Ringling Brothers, and he was with them for several years. Then around 1910, he became half owner of the Ship Felta Circus. And they made uh, several tours of South America and the West Indies. In fact, uh, daughter Virginia was born while they were on tour in Santiago, Chile in 1912. So um, it was kind of he and Olive's honeymoon trip that they were gone for three years, so it ended up with a kid, too. Um, and here's a... a a piece from the Indianapolis Star uh, in 1919. Uh, they're back from their three-year tour, and here's uh, all the countries they went to. Uh, this story detail, de details 
you know, that's why it took them three years. Because uh, they, they started in, in uh, um, I think, uh, well, whichever, post Costa Rica, I think. And then they went south, down one side of the continent. They crossed the mountains, came up the other one. And then got on a steamer and shipped the whole uh, mess out to the West Indies to hit Trinidad and Barbados and Jamaica. And when they would do one of these things, when they get to the end, they would just dis they what called disband the company. They'd send everybody home. They'd find some place to quarter the animals. And then they would, uh, in this case, uh, they were planning to take eight months off. Uh, before they put the whole band back together and did it again. And um, let's see, okay. You see, Catherine was born in 1915. That's because they got their timing better. And she was born when they were in Bloomington on winter break. Uh, and uh, it, it was kind of a sad story. Uh, the circus closed abruptly in the, I, I think this was probably around 1925. I don't know for sure exactly when, when Olive Feltus became seriously ill. So um, when she didn't improve, Roy disbanded the show, came back to Bloomington, purchased a home on North Walnut Street, and tried every available means to restore his wife's health. And she died in June 1927, and her death certificate attributes her death to breast cancer. And then um, Roy later, some years later, uh, this was 1927, and then four years later he married again, and this was a uh, Bloomington girl, Grace Pike. And this was the Feltus home on North Walnut Street. Uh, perhaps some of you remember it being up there before it was torn down. I think there was a little shopping uh, retail place put in there. Pardon? It was definitely in the furniture department. Oh, okay. What, the house? Oh, okay. Well, uh, after Olive passed, well, uh, he... Uh, Roy worked for his brother-in-law, uh, Bob Harris. Uh, he was the advertising manager for the uh, Harris Grand and Princess Theaters. Uh, when um, Robert Harris, around 1929, 1930, he leased those theaters to the Paramount. Um, and then um, Roy started Hoosier Outdoor Advertising Company. And he had a desk in the uh, courier bill, I mean, in the uh, uh, star offices, which were in uh, the uh, Allen building on Kirkwood, like 101, 102 East Kirkwood. And uh, a lot of it was underneath the ground, was in the basement. This is Roy's daughter, and... Uh, Mike uh, put her in the advertising, so I got to talk about her. She was born in 1915. This was Catherine Feltus. Her married name is Preston for Robert Preston, who became well known for The Music Man and Victor Victoria and lots of stage and Broadway productions. Uh, she graduated from Bloomington High School in 1932, uh, Phi Beta Kappa from IU in 1936. And uh, shortly after her graduation, she went out to the West Coast, and she became a student at the Pasadena Playhouse, and that's where she met Mr. Preston. And as you would say, they were smitten, just right from the start. And uh, he helped her actually get a contract with Paramount, because he was already under contract with them. Um, and she... She worked quite steadily in the decade of the 40s, had 38 film credits. Uh, this is Catherine as a child. Uh, it's more, you've seen some pictures, but they're at age two, and this is Gertrude, and uh, this is uh, Lucille Feltus. 
This is Catherine at Bloomington High School. And that's her senior picture. And this, she was in, she's somewhere in here in the cast of what was called Collegiana. This was a, a, a musical and comedy review. And there were over 100 people, uh, drama was a big thing at Bloomington High School, apparently, because there were over 100 people in this, in this company. And they played uh, two nights. Uh, at, it was described as one of the big theaters downtown. So, you know, that's what you get when you have your uncle that owns two of the big theaters downtown. You get your high school uh, production done there. This is her at Indiana University. She was all everything at, at, I, at IU. Uh, she was uh, named the... Uh, uh, Actress of the Year in 1935. Here she's singing uh, Stormy Monday in an IU review. And this is her uh, kind of a glamour shot that in, uh, in the, this was from the 36 Arbutus. She was selected as one of the five loveliest co-eds on campus. And in Hollywood, uh, she she uh, was mostly smaller roles, um, you know, like not the lead, maybe the second or the third, you know, female got you know parts. These are kind of some of her more more featured roles. Um, Doris Karloff was in this one. Uh, this one she got pretty good reviews for these three. Uh, this was with uh, Randolph Scott. And um, this was, uh, um, uh, you know, eight people in a lifeboat, only seven will live kind of movie, uh, kind of a post-war kind of movie. Now, she didn't forget the home folks. She came back uh, periodically, of course, because you couldn't get far away from that Feltz's family. Here is uh, Catherine posing with Dot. Uh, for blue, uh, world premiere of her movie Doomed to Die in August 1940. And this is a program for an IU theater production of Arsic and No Lace in 1943. She came back uh, as a guest actress. She was, um, she maintained a lifelong correspondent with Lee Norville, you know, the theater's name for. He created the IU theater program. And she actually uh, starred in the first production of his IU theater program. So uh, they were friends for life. And uh, she was his teaching assistant her senior year. Catherine also maintained a decades-long correspondence with Dorothy and Dot. And this is a selection of the, the things she would send. A lot of small, quick notes, often around the hot winter holidays. It was always, you know, asking about, you know, uh, Dorothy and Gertrude and Dot, and uh, t always telling them what Bob's latest project uh, was and, and where they could see him on the screen and later uh, on television. And this is an autographed photo of Robert Preston uh, that was uh, that she sent Dot in, in 1935. And I, I say 1935 because of the letter said she uh, she asked for photos, said she'd seen him in, in Union Pacific. That came out in 1935. And in uh, the letter that went with the picture, Catherine told her his next big picture was going to be Bo Jest with Gary Cooper and Ray Milland. That also came out in 1939. So... I'm just, you know, assume this was about that time. Um, and uh, in the letter that went with this, and she was also, uh, you know, in all her notes, you could tell she was very fond of uh, Gertrude and Dorothy Kay. Uh, she called Dorothy Kay uh, a bright light of my childhood. Um, so, you know, especially after her mother died, it, they must have all spent a lot of time together. Oh, and she also said that uh, when she first went out to uh, Hollywood, she didn't know how to cook or sew. And Dot was so lucky to have a, a mother and grandmother that would teach her all those things when she was a child. 
Uh, here's the, the last of the Felta siblings, Paul. He was born in 1889, so he wasn't even that much older than uh, Dorothy and Pearl, so you could tell that, that made them all very close. Uh, he began working uh, at the Star. Uh, er, all the kids worked uh, at the Star growing up, you know, because, you know, H. Day, you know, he was scraping by. He needed all the help he could get, especially free help. So, uh, but Paul, as well as Harry, really stuck with it and made it uh, their uh, profession eventually. Uh, he began working uh, in earnest for the Star around 1910 and started taking over some of the managerial responsibilities. Uh, you know, H.J. was getting up there in years, and and uh, he, he was ready to turn stuff over. Like his other brothers, he'd been in the National Guard, but in 1917, when the U.S. entered the war, he enlisted in the regular army and served in the Coast Artillery. And then from 1920 to 1965, he was president of the Feltus Printing Corporation, uh, printing company and editor of the Weekly Star, and what later became the Star Courier. I got more on because he was really, he did a lot of stuff. He married Lucille Clevenger here in, in, in June. Uh, they had two children, Martha and Paula. And 1928-33, he's on the city school board. And then he was on the IU Board of Trustees for almost 20 years in two different stints. 1965, he sells the Star Courier. And uh, he ended as an associate editor and consultant to the Bloomington Courier Tribune. And that was a paper started by Sarkis Tarzian. Uh, this is Paul and Lucille. Uh, there's kind of a kind of a tragedy in this story too. Uh, Lucille died in 1934, a few years after, uh, a few days after Martha was, uh, I mean Paula was born. Uh, so she died in 1934, also in March, and of a uh, pul pulmonary embolism, according to her death certificate. And then Paul would marry, he was a single dad for about nine years, and he, he married um, Thelma Hinkle in 1943, I believe. Paul was a newspaper man early on. Uh, he, was, uh, he was featured in an Indianapolis news story for producing a newspaper for his uh, buddies in Bloomington. And he charged him five cents a month, claimed he had about 50 subscribers. It was called The Rattler. And years later, uh, there would be one edition a year of The Rattler, and that was for H.J.'s birthday. And, uh, and when the kids would, would tell uh, good-natured jokes at veteran editor's expense, because H.J., he liked a good joke, and he, he wrote a lot of... Uh, 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 cringeworthy ones uh, in the paper if you look at those editions very much. Um, this is uh, Paul uh, on the roof of a building uh, somewhere in 1902. I assume it's uh, downtown. I don't, maybe it's uh, the Allen building. Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't done a forensic uh, examination of the background there. This is uh, uh, Paul with a uh, Feltus Printing Company uh, car, and this is probably after he got out of the service around 1920. And um, as I said, he was on the IU uh, Board of Trustees for uh, many years. Uh, this is him. He's sitting next here to H.G. Wells. Uh, not H.G. Wells. Uh, Herman B. Wells. Maybe he was H.G. Wells. <laughs> Uh, and, he, you know, as all newspapers, at least any that are any good, take, a, take the election seriously. Here is uh, Paul. And, whoa, whoa. Well, that's strange. How did I get there? Oh, I'm out of the... Oh, is that 
Esperar, ¿eh? And we're almost to the end, so. Okay. Okay. And anyway, so this is a 1947 election. Here is Tom Lemon, uh, Mayor Jack Bruner, and Walter Woodburn. At least that's the way the, the caption read. And I assume, uh, they might know, did Tom Lemon win that one? He's the only guy there that I absolutely knew was a mayor here, so I assumed that was the case. Huh? And Bruner. Yeah, Bruner. He was a mayor at the time when this was taken. He was the outgoing mayor, and I don't know, this may have been a campaign, probably, a, I don't know if they had debates back then or not, or what the deal was. And uh, this is the last slide I have here. And this is the Feltus Bunch back together. Uh, this is sometime before, well, Harry died in 52, so it was somewhere before then. Uh, John, uh, he, all, he left, uh, he disappeared from the city directories around 1920, turned up in Lexington, Kentucky, where he was working for the Ringling Brothers. And then he later, he also had an outdoor advertising company. So maybe these guys kept in touch about that. Um, he was not estranged from the family, as far as I know. Uh, uh, Dot wrote about taking the train to, to uh, uh, well, it was Lexington, to visit Uncle John. So he just didn't live in Bloomington. But this, and then I'll give H.J. Uh, the last word because I think he would like that. Uh, should I retire as a newspaper editor? Should a newspaper editor ever retire from the profession which he loves so dearly? They say that to the circus man, the lure of the sawdust ring is eternal. So too is the lure of printer's ink. And this was, uh, and if there was any bunch that could prove that, it was these five people right here. Okay, if I got so I think I'll I'll ask uh, first if there are any um, oh and I'm right at, at my time because my timer's going off so um, any questions anybody have any questions.